Well, we'll get started here today. Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our webinar today. Today we're going to talk about designing systems with PoE amplification. So just want to double check, make sure everybody can hear me okay. So if you can't, if you could send a message or raise a hand in the chat. But let's see, uh, we'll get started here. My name is Jason Kleiman. I'm an applications engineer here at Biamp. I joined the company back in February of 2015. I'm one of our remote applications engineers, so I am not located in Beaverton, Oregon. Uh, there are three of us that are located either in the Eastern or Central time zones to better accommodate those of you who are located in the Eastern or Central time zones. So I am coming to you from Jasper, Indiana, the booming metropolis in uh, Southern Indiana. So we'll get started. Uh, this uh, topics of this webinar, we're going to go through PoE, give you a little bit of an idea of what PoE is, where it came from, why it exists, what we can do with it. We're going to talk a little more about amplifiers and how much power do we really need for the type of systems that, that, that we're covering in our target market. And then we'll go through BiAMP's offerings as far as PoE amplifiers. And then We'll have some Q&A at the end. Um, if you could please hold questions until the end, I probably won't be able to take a look at those until until then because we'll run out of time. So for those of you who do want to stick around a little longer, then I can uh, look at those. And if I don't get to them while we're live, uh, we'll follow up with you via email. So let's take a look at what POE is and why do we need it. Starting off, we've got a traditional installation. Let's just take a look at a security camera example we have a camera located out in the field somewhere and that needs to feed back to a recorder that's located in a different spot in an equipment room somewhere else and we likely have multiple cameras that are feeding into that same recorder so traditionally we need to get a video signal to it which requires a piece of cable and then we also need to get power out to that same so how do we do that um, sometimes we can put power supplies back at the rack. Some cameras come with their own little power supplies that we use. Sometimes we get a separate power supply that is like a large rack mount power supply that will supply power to multiple devices. But either way, we have to get power to that power supply and then send it out to the field device. And that's DC going out to that. So now we have a DC voltage and a, a video signal. This is an, assuming an analog video signal at this point. So some disadvantages to this, you've got longer cable runs, which is bad for our DC power. So we may need heavier gauge cable to get, get power out there and account for any voltage drops over longer runs. And we need multiple cable types. So in this case, we need a video signal. So we need a cable for that. We need a power pair. And maybe those are in the same jacket. Maybe they're not, two separate cables. Either way, we've got to pull, um, pull some cable out there of either different types or a complex cable. And that's going to be a little more expensive to install. Option B, we can actually put power out a little closer to the endpoint. That's always an option. We still have some of the same hangups, though. We, we still have to run cable two different cable types. We've still got to get signal, and it's going one place, and now power is going to a different location. We may need more, uh, more electrical work to do that. Uh, it's going to have to still rely on multiple cable types. It's also more challenging to troubleshoot. If you've got a power supply located in an equipment room somewhere, it may be behind a, a locked door. The person that's servicing the system later on down the road may not know where it is. It just, just makes for an overall more complex installation. So what we want to do is put data and power on one cable to get a single cable solution. And at this point, we're getting into cameras that are going to operate over Ethernet which seems to be one of the more common modes today. So let's take a look at a PoE installation. We still have a camera located out in the field and we have a recorder located somewhere else, possibly multiple recorders. So we're gonna have a data connection to get ethernet to that recorder and we're gonna go through an ethernet switch. And then that switch is going to have its own AC power. And then on the other side, we're going to send data and power to that camera. So we now have an ethernet video stream coming from the camera through a standard ethernet switch to our recorder. And our power can be located in the same, well, it's going to be located in the same rack as the, as the ethernet switch. So 
with that opens up the topology of an ethernet network. We don't have to have one switch, we can have multiple switches. So we can have power on our edge switch that's going to the camera and that can feed multiple cameras, which then feeds back to a core switch, which then drives the recorder. So we have a lot more flexibility when it comes to doing this type of solution. The cable's more cost effective you may be able to install it a little easier. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, sometimes just getting one Cat5 cable to a location may be a little easier than trying to get two different cable types or a larger, heavier, um, multi-purpose cable. And it's easier to troubleshoot. We have all the standard Ethernet troubleshooting tools at our disposal as well. So some of the switches will even have built-in diagnostics to tell you, uh, to give you an idea of what's connected to it how much power is actually going to that particular device. So all of those are advantages to using PoE. PoE is a standard. 802.3 AF in 2003 is the standard that most people are familiar with when it comes to PoE. And that was, this one was released in 2003 and the street term for this would be the one that people refer to when they say PoE. And it's going to deliver a maximum of almost 13 watts to the device. Now, the device providing that power is going to give you 15.4 watts, but to account for cable loss or uh, DC voltage drop in the cable, we've got 12.95 watts guaranteed at the device. And it's gonna be in a range between 37 and 57 volts, but most of the time it's, it's 48 volts. In 2009, that was not enough for it. So we come out with a new standard that delivers more power and that's where POE Plus comes, comes from. So we introduced 802.3 AT, which includes everything from 802.3 AF, but then adds this additional, um, additional chunk of power to get you up to 25 and a half watts at the device. And the voltage range is just a little bit tighter on that, but the, um, the nominal voltage still is 48 volts on that. We have another one that's 802.3 BT, and this is a new one, a newer, a new by standards terms, it was uh, defined in September 2018. It's not widely adapted yet, but this is going to give us 51 watts at the device or 71 watts at the device, depending on the type. So we can get a lot more power. And we're not gonna talk about that one today. There's another one I wanna mention here, 802.3BU, which is mostly applicable to automotive and industrial, but not to AV. So the two we wanna concentrate on are the 802.3 AF 2003 and 802.3 AT 2009, which are our PoE and PoE Plus. These newer devices, this newer PoE standard will, as equipment becomes more readily available, manufacturers embrace the technology and making endpoints on that. We're gonna see more and more stuff come out, but as of what we have available to us today, it's, uh, it's gonna be around these two. So originally, well, 10 base T and 100 base T networks only use two of the data pairs. So we actually had uh, two extra pairs in that cable that we could use. And there were two modes of power delivery operation to that with PoE. So we could use the spare pair that was not used for data, or we could piggyback the power on top of the, uh, on top of the data. So there was a mode A and a mode B associated with that. But now with uh, gigabit ethernet, we need all of our pairs, so we're also putting power on uh, two of the data pairs. With the uh, higher powered version, that's going to deliver it on all four pairs. It's a little bit of terminology. We refer to the devices that supply the power as PSEs for power sourcing equipment, which is our in-span, um, a switch or a mid-span, which would be a PoE injector that actually doesn't do anything other than provide power. It doesn't do anything with the data other than pass it straight through. Our endpoints are our PDs or powered devices. And that's going to be you know, our PoE amplifiers that we're going to talk about today or any other device that you may have that's powered over ethernet. We break a PoE up into classes. We have four individual power classes. And these have very specific definitions as far as what the maximum power is going to be available at the device or what the power that's going to be provided by the PSE. And these are related to the standards. 
So we have class 0, 1, 2, and 3 related to the original standard, 802.3 AF, and then we have class four, which was introduced in 802.3 AT. So we have PoE and PoE plus. And what's really the difference? The classification system allows us to define how much power is actually going to be allocated to that device or how much power that device is going to request from the switch. So that was developed with the original standard of 802.3 AF. And we have a class one, two, or three for lower power. And then if a device doesn't advertise itself or doesn't participate in this classification process, then it's going to get the maximum power, which we'll cover the details of why this is important shortly. But 802.3 AF slides over to 802.3 AT, so the first uh, four classes, 0, 1, 2, and 3, which, yes, 3 and 1, or sorry, 3 and 0 are the same. But in the new standard, 802.3 AT, they are referred to as type 1 devices. And then our type 2 device includes the class 4, which is the 25 and a half watts, which is referred to as PoE+. Plus. Uh, the reason I want to explain this and put this up here very specifically is that you will see equipment that's advertised as 802.3 AT type 1. Well, that is not PoE plus. It, that's still the PoE, what we refer to as the PoE plus standard, but 802.3 AT type 1 is still a maximum of 12.95 watts. 802.3 AT type 2 or type 2 class 4 is going to be the uh, 25 and a half watts. So it's something very important to look at when you're uh, when you're looking at, at uh, power sourcing equipment to make sure that the standard is correct and it's actually providing you with exactly what you're going to need for that endpoint. So what's the point of all these classes and and types? Well, we want to be efficient in, in using our power. So we want devices uh, to only consume or only ask for how much power they need to consume. So if we look at an example of a, a switch that has a budget of 380 watts, we have a total of 380 watts available. Well, let's say all the devices were allocated the maximum of 30 watts. Well, with that, we could only have, oh, my slides never seem to show up right on here, but we could only have a, a certain number of devices on here with 30 watts, and that, that limit is 12 at this point, and we have 20 watts left over. So if we have devices that only require three watts, four watts, five watts, but they're reserving 30 watts, then we're just wasting, wasting power budget. So if we take that same 380 watt budget, and we break it up to where the devices that we plug in are only requesting the amount of power they need, or what class they're associated with, then ultimately if we have a lot of low power devices, we can power more devices on the same switch and we can mix and match as well. So it just gives us the ability to have more efficient use of available power and we can have more devices on a single switch if, um, you know, if they are less than the, the maximum 30 watts. So we can take a look at an example of how we would develop a POE budget or plan for a POE budget. Now this is a very simple case. We need to know a few very specific items, one of which is the total POE budget of the switch. How much power will that particular switch supply? Two, what are the classes of the endpoints? And three, based on those classes, how much power can we get from the PSE or the switch or the mid span? And then we can divide two by one, so we know we have the maximum power. Sorry, we know we have the, yeah, we have the maximum power of the switch and we know the power required by each device, just simple math, and we can end up with how many devices we can have on that switch. This example is assuming that they are all drawing the same amount of power. A very important thing to consider, the number of PoE ports that a switch will support at any given time. Not all switches support power on all ports. Some switches, if you may have a 24 port switch and it may give you PoE on ports one through 12. You may have a 24 port switch, but it'll only allow you to have PoE on maybe 12 ports at a time. 
but maybe they're not specifically ports one through 12. So it's very important to look at the switch documentation to understand if there are any limitations with that or not. So let's look at a, a real world example. The Summit X440 G2 by Extreme is a 24 port, port, 24 port PoE switch. And let's say we want to use some uh, TCM1A uh, devices on that network. Uh, TCM1A is one of our pendant beam tracking microphones with a built-in two-channel amplifier. So we know our switch has a total of 380 watts available. The TCM1A is a PoE Plus device. It's an 802.3 AT Type 2 Class 4, and that's information you can find in, in the spec sheets, and that should be available for all PoE devices out there. That It should tell you what class it is. So we know by that class that it's going to want 30 watts of PoE. So we do the math and we come up with 12.67. We can't have 0.67, so that's gonna limit us to 12 in this particular case. Now on the extreme, we can have PoE on all 24 ports. So there are no restrictions in our design on which port we can plug that device into. So in this example, we would be able to have a total of 12. Now, if you have devices that are uh, of different classes on that network, you would have to get a little bit more creative with that math, but uh, you know, we're in the audio business. We, we love math, at least I hope we do. I always have. So how do we negotiate this PoE to the devices? Because you can't just automatically have power available on a switch port because there are things that if you plugged in, suddenly you have 30 watts available at uh, 48 volts, it could fry a device that is not, not ready for that. So with classes one through three, we have a one event hardware handshake. So when you plug a device in, the switch will send out a little voltage impulse and it's not going to be uh, harmful to devices that don't use PoE, it's very low voltage. And then there's a little bit of a current exchange between the two that decides what the class is going to be. And then the switch registers that information and then it starts delivering power to that device. If we have a PoE plus device, we need more than that standard power. So we're going to go through that process again. We're gonna have the voltage impulse after it gets connected the device is going to give it a class four current to say, hey, I'm a class four device. Then the device is going to, the switch is going to turn on 803.2AF PoE power. Notice that's not the higher current at this point. So we're just providing base PoE maximum. And then we're going to send another voltage impulse just to make sure. And then that device is going to reply again say, hey, I am a class four device, and then the switch will turn on the full PoE plus power. So there are some cases that you need to be aware of where if you have a device that is not powering up correctly, take a look at the switch. There's a chance that the second negotiation step is failing or that it requires this next method, which is LLDP. So we have two ways of using hardware negotiation, and right now we have one way of using software. So LLDP is an Ethernet protocol that's used to communicate with uh, between the PSE and the PD. So we go through a similar process. We go through actually the exact same process as that first event, and then we give it 803.2AF power, standard PoE. At that point, the device can somewhat power up, but then once that's done, the, system's, uh, the switch is going to send an LLDP request, and then the two devices are going to communicate using data at that point, not just the hardware, before it decides to turn on PoE plus power and give you the full power. So it's critical to know what your PSC is going to provide because some switches require you to go in and turn that on. There are some, there are some commands in Extreme that you would have to go in and execute to be able to, to enable LLDP. So something to keep in mind, a, um, a device, a PD, so our endpoints that are class four have to support both methods. We have to support the two event hardware method and LLDP. All of your endpoints will have to support both of those. However, 
the power sourcing equipment, so your switch or your mid-span, if most mid-spans, uh, it depends on whether it's going to support LLDP or not, but they only support one. So it's going to support either the two event hardware or LLDP to be able to get the PoE Plus working. So it's important to know which which one your PSE uses and to make sure it's enabled. So check your switches documentation if you're using the switch. Your PoE injectors and the majority of your uh, of your mid spans just use the hardware negotiation method. There are some advantages and disadvantages to both. The advantage to the hardware, um, it's very quick. You can plug a device in and that negotiation process usually takes place in around two seconds or less. So a device is going to get power, it's gonna power up pretty quick, it's robust, uh, it's, it's very well proven. The software-based, uh, software-based, ah, sorry, I can't talk. The software-based classification method takes quite a bit longer. It can actually take up to 20 seconds sometimes for a device to complete that negotiation process before it fully gets powered up. Some troubleshooting methods are there. You can use Wireshark to do network captures and frequently see that data as well. And I think you'll see more LLDP come up as we get this new standard in place too. So that's, uh, that's a little idea on what we're talking about when we get to PoE. Now we're going to jump into our next section to get an amplification. So how much power do we really need when it comes to an amplifier? One of my favorite pictures of all time, uh, the wall of sound from, I think this picture was taken in 1974. So for those of you who may not be aware of the wall of sound, I highly recommend you Google it because in the audio industry, there's uh, this is pretty legendary. It was from the Grateful Dead back in the day, back before we really didn't deliver large, huge arena type PA to a, yeah, for a rock concert. But that's not what we're after. We're not, we're not going to be powering this uh, with PoE amplifiers. It looks cool, sounded cool back in 1974, but it, uh, that's not what we're after. We're going for something more like this. PoE amplifiers have their place in smaller rooms with fewer numbers of speakers and smaller speakers that are closer to the listeners. So this is where PoE amplification really shines. So what we did was we sat down and took a long look at the performance needs of your, of your typical conference rooms today and what's being installed and really discovered that most people in a conference room are seated six to nine feet from a loudspeaker. Sure, there are bigger rooms out there where you're going to be further away, but the average one, you're looking at that six to nine foot range for the majority of them. So with that distance, with a small, you know, four, six or eight inch ceiling speaker or a small surface mount speaker of that same same size, you, you really don't need a lot of power. We're finding that a lot of installs were done with amplifiers that were way too big. So you may not need a 200 watt amplifier for four six inch ceiling speakers. It might be a little overkill, I think. So continuous pink noise at 80 dB SPL is a common benchmark. So we want, we want the system to be able to hit that level at those six to nine foot distances consistently throughout the listening area. So how loud does it need to be? I mean, we're talking about speech. With a conferencing system, we're getting into reinforcing speech in the room. So we're going to want that spoken word coming out of the speakers that's coming from the far end to be arriving at the listener's ears at about the same level that a normal conversation would be held at that same location. So speech typically is about 65 to 70 dB at one foot. So knowing that, we can take a look at an equation to uh, the EPR is electrical power required, but we need to know a few things before we can plug in, uh, plug some numbers into that formula. We need to know what the target volume we need to provide at the listener position. And that's going to typically be your, your speech level. So you want to be able to get normal speech at 65 to 70 dB at the listening position. You wanna know what the distance is between the listener 
and the speaker, what that maximum distance is, and you need to know the specifications of the loudspeakers used in the room. And then you want some headroom. Headroom is, uh, is set, set up for peaks. You're going to have uh, audio signals are not static. You have, they're very dynamic. You have quieter spots and you have peaks and we need some headroom built into the system to accommodate for those peaks. And then with that, we can calculate the minimum amplifier needs. So we need to do the, uh, do the math or, um, you know, if we have prints, we'll have to do the math. If we're actually in a room, we can take, a, take a, a laser measuring device and just find out exactly how far that is before we put everything in. But we need to know that, that distance from the, the listener's ears to the loudspeaker, to the closest loudspeaker to them. And we need to consider the inverse square law. So the inverse square law states that we're going to lose 6 dB in level for each doubling of distance. So if we make a measurement at one foot and it's 70 dB, at two feet it's going to be 64 dB, and then at four feet it's going to drop to 58 dB. And then if we're going the other direction, we can calculate how loud something is going to be at one foot if we know how loud it is at four feet. So we need to measure all of this um, and then take a look at the loudspeaker sensitivity. So loudspeaker sensitivity is a rating that's applied uh, to allow, well, not applied, but it's measured. And this is how we rate loudspeakers. We know that a very specific input signal at a certain power level will yield a certain sound pressure level at a certain distance or at a known distance. So the standard measurement is a one kilohertz tone. You put one watt of power into the, into the loudspeaker, and then you need to know what that level is at one meter. So the measurement may not actually be made at one meter. It may be made in a, you know, larger speakers in a free field where you measure it further away and then use the inverse square law to actually get back to that one meter. But ultimately the published specification will be a uh, one watt, one meter level. And we need to know that because then we can turn around and apply the inverse square law to that loudspeaker and find out what that's going to be like at the listening position. So your typical conferencing speakers, you know, four, six, eight inch ceiling speakers, maybe some two-way surface mount speakers, they're going to be in that 85 to 92 dB SPL range as far as their sensitivity goes. So using that, we can determine how loud the playback will be when we have a, you know, a peak power in the amplifier. So if we know the power amplifier rating, we know the sensitivity of the loudspeaker, we can apply that and find out how loud it's going to be at the listening position. So higher sensitivity level or values of the loudspeaker basically mean that that loudspeaker is going to be louder. So an 82 dB sensitivity rating on a loudspeaker, that, that loudspeaker is going to be 82 dB at one meter with one watt applied. 92 dB means it's going to be 92 dB at one meter with one watt applied. So sometimes it's, it's more, well, I think most cases it's probably more cost effective to get a better loudspeaker than it is to just buy a more powerful amplifier because you may need to buy a much larger amplifier just to get a little bit of uh, increase in level, and that can be a, a huge price jump. So you always want to take a look at your sensitivity specification for your loudspeakers. This is just an example from our CIC6, which has a, a 90 dB sensitivity rating. So the next thing is how much headroom do you need? Well, typically your headroom levels are going to be around you know, 10 dB for speech and 20 for program material, but let's look at exactly what that means. So uh, an audio signal will clip, and as we know, sound is, is not static. It's, it's very dynamic. It's constantly louder, quieter, louder, quieter, louder, quieter. So we look at that and we kind of have a general overall, maybe an average level over a period of time. And we look at that and we know we have peaks that are gonna be above that average level and then dips that are going to be below. So from the highest peak to the clipping region, where the signal clips, that's, you know, that's some headroom you want to build in. That way you can drive a little harder and you can have extra room for peaks that may go above your normal operating level. And then you have a signal to noise ratio, which is going to be 
the level between your uh, your lowest point in that signal and the noise floor. And a minimum signal to noise ratio for speech intelligibility is about 25 dB um, and 35 dB for really good music clarity. You really need to look at noise ratings in conference rooms and go out and measure them to make sure uh, that you know what the noise floor is to make sure you can stay above that. So you basically have two types that we need to look at when it comes to amplifiers and coming up with our power requirements on amplifiers. We have our continuous program information, which is fairly steady throughout a signal. And it's gonna be our RMS output or our continuous power output of an amplifier. And then we have our peak program information or peak program material, which will be our instantaneous transients and spikes that are above that RMS level. So our peaks can be as much as you know 12 to dB, uh, sorry, 12 to 18 dB higher than our normal constant signal level. And there are two different power ratings that we're going to look at in a little while as well. Signals have a crest factor. And if we take a look at a sine wave, if we measure a sine wave that is a one volt sine wave, one volt peak sine wave, and we run that through an RMS for the root mean square of that, we're gonna get a, a reading of 0 0.707. So if you take a regular analog voltmeter, yeah, that's not a true RMS meter and measure the output of a sine wave, and that's a one volt peak sine wave, you're gonna read that on a meter to be 0 0.707, even though the peak is at one volt. So that actually gives us what we call a crest factor. So the difference between that RMS level and the actual peak is our crest factor, and that's why we need to leave room for those peaks. You can do the math on a uh, on a sine wave, but it comes up with a 3 dB crest factor for a sine wave. That's a steady state signal. If we look at the crest factors for different types of signals, you'll see that there's quite a bit of variance in that. Um, you know, um, a sine wave is 3 dB, but a square wave or basically flat, you know, it's a 0 dB crest factor. Those are all the way at the top. We look at pink noise, which is a common source that we use to test with. Pink noise typically has a crest factor of 6 dB, but that's not what we're playing back all the time. We're playing back for a conference system. We have AV playback and we have a lot of speech. So human speech is going to have a 12 to 14 dB crest factor. And, you know, jazz, classical, will have a pretty high crest factor. Rock and roll has a lower crest factor because it's usually heavily compressed. And uh, around 8 dB is, is a published average of that. But, you know, some of the stuff I listened to today, I think it's got a crest factor of uh, quite a bit less than that. Um, so that's where we need to build in that, that headroom for those peaks. So we want to, to take a look at that when we compute these amplifier requirements. So now that we have a little bit more background information on that, we can look at what our EPR is, and this is the electrical power required at the loudspeaker. So we need to know these variables. We need to know what the sound pressure level is at that D2 distance. So at the listener, what level do we want it to be? And that's L sub P. And that's going to be that 65 to 70 dB speech level. How much headroom do we need in the system? And I apologize for this. I realized this just before I did this, that we have a conflict here. The H in this equation is for the headroom. That's a dB value. The H over here in this illustration, which probably should just take out, is actually for height. So those two H's are uh, completely separate. So I apologize for that. I'll get these slides corrected. L sub S is the loudspeaker sensitivity. So this is that dB rating how much SPL at one meter with one watt. And then D2 is our distance from the loudspeaker to the listener's ears. And then D sub R is our reference value and D sub R and W ref, those are from our sensitivity ratings on our loudspeakers. So um, D sub R would be our meter, our one meter, and W ref would be our one watt. So that's our loudspeaker sensitivity. Ratings. So we can go in and you know come up with those numbers and throw that information in there and come up with the with the results to that. There's always a faster way, and we love our calculators here. We actually have a, a calculator available on our Cornerstone site that will do all of that math for you. 
Now, this is definitely not the only one out there. We, there are uh, apps you can download on your phone that will do this for you. There are some other online calculators, but let me pull this up live here really quick. But this will take care of all that for you. Basically, you have a, a calculator here, and you can get to this just by going to support.biamp.com, and we have an icon that actually says, uh, let me go actually show it to you here. Go to support.biamp.com. We have a little icon here for calculators, and this is our amplifier power calculator, which is the first one available. And from here, we can just put in our, our loudspeaker sensitivity. Let, let's say, actually, let's take this down a little. Let's go, oops, wrong way. Then we have a, a speaker with 87 dB sensitivity. And let's say we're in that nine foot distance, and we want it to be 70 dB SPL, and we're using 12 dB as our headroom for our peaks. And as you can see, that doesn't require a 200 watt amplifier. It doesn't even require a 50 watt amplifier. In fact, in that case with our peaks, which are actually going to be hitting 82 dB, that's only 2.4 watts at that point, which is not much power. I mean, that would deliver a, a sufficient signal coming out of that particular type of loudspeaker at that level. And if we want to take that up a little bit, let's say we want it to be 80. Let's say we just want to make sure we've got enough enough in there to really really play some stuff back if you've got a meeting that, that is, is really getting hopping or something. But um, even then, if we want to get it up to 80, so our average continuous level at 80 with our peaks are hitting 92, at that point, that's still only requiring a... Uh, you know, 23.8 watts of peak burst power in that case. So, you know, that we're still less than 25 watts total power required for that. Oops, sorry. Uh, give me just a second. So, a couple rules of thumb when, when it comes to thinking of amplifier requirements and loudspeaker sensitivity ratings. If we double the amplifier power, we're only getting uh, an extra 3 dB increase in our, in our signal level. Four times the power gets us 6 dB, and 10 times gets us 10 dB. So if you could imagine, if you get a, a loudspeaker that has a higher sensitivity rating, that's probably going to be less expensive than going from a 100 watt amp to a 1,000 watt amp. So keep that in mind. There are some uh, yeah, design considerations for that. So let's jump into talking about PoE amplifiers. So just to recap what we've talked about so far, we know we have a method of getting 25 and a half watts to a device on a network over a single network cable. And we also know that there are a lot of situations where we don't need that much power. We really maybe only need four or five watts of, of peak power for a small loudspeaker in a small room. And we also have uh, network media protocols like Cobranet, Dante, AVB. And these will deliver real-time audio over Ethernet networks. So this is where PoE amplifiers come in. Why don't we just create a network amplifier that uses PoE? So you know, if I had a lot of dramatic music, we could put that in at this point. But uh, I should have thought a little bit more ahead on that. But Basically, a typical system for a small conference room with a PoE amplifier would be this. You could throw in a DSP. We have a Tessera Forte. It's connected over AVB to one of our amplifiers. And our amplifiers are only AVB. I mentioned there are other Ethernet protocols, but I just wanted to throw that out there because um, it's sort of a holistic, um, overall holistic view of you know, the technology. But for our PoE amplifiers, they are AVB amplifiers. And in this case, we're going AVB to a switch to an amplifier. And in fact, we can actually go direct AVB through a PoE injector or a mid-span to that amplifier as well and not need the switch if we're only using a single amplifier. So that's where we're going with using PoE. But how much power can we really get out of a, a PoE amplifier? So we said we have 25 and a half watts. Can we have a 25 and a half watt amplifier? Well, the answer is no. Um, there's quite a bit of electronics also in that little device. 
to, to basically power it. It has a processor, it, it has a network card, it has to to get audio over Ethernet and in AVB, so all in, in the communications as well to control it. So that takes up power. Then we have yet to come up with a 100% efficient amplifier. It'd be wonderful if we did, but uh, nobody has yet to develop one. So it's going to vary by manufacturer's design. Uh, there are there are some other uh, PoE amplifiers out there. Uh, we do um, provide with our dedicated amplifiers. We have our 450P and 450BP models, and these will provide 15 watts into a single channel. So from 25 and a half watts of PoE, you're getting an audio device that is on the network, manageable, and we're sending digital audio to it and getting 15 watts into one channel, into a four or eight ohm load. Then you specify that it's set up. Uh, we can do seven watts into two or three watts into four channels. But what about those peaks we mentioned before? Well, with peak power, we can get up to 50 watts per channel at four ohms and 30 watts per channel into eight ohms. So I said we only have 25 and a half watts available. So how are we getting 50 watts of power out of a device when we're only putting 25 and a half watts into it? Well, that gets into a little bit of the secret sauce and magic, which we're calling burst power. So audio signals are very dynamic. We're not sending full power to the loudspeaker all the time if we've designed our system right, which hopefully we're not. So why don't we just store some of that energy up when it's below that level? So that's what we're doing with this burst power. We have a reserve, and when the signals are below that maximum continuous power available, we're charging up that reserve. And then, just a second here. If our signal goes over that, we're going to pull some power out of that reserve. So what happens in the real world scenario is the signal's going above the max, below the max, above the max, below the max. So we're constantly charging and and pulling out of that power reserve. And that's where burst power comes in. That's how we're able to deliver that additional power for those peaks. So if you take a look at a typical speech signal, this is just a capture of a, of a lecture from taken out of Audacity. Now, the dotted line on here that says maximum continuous power available is, is sort of arbitrary. That's just for illustrative purposes. We're saying that if we hit that level, then that's what that's the signal level that will drive that amplifier to maximum continuous power. So then we have our peaks, which are going to go above that. And as you can see, speech is full of peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. But we seem to have more valleys than peaks in most speech signals. So anytime it's going to be below that line in that green area, we're going to be able to charge up that reserve. And then anytime it falls outside of that area, we're going to pull some power out of that reserve. So naturally, that reserve isn't endless. What happens if we if we deplete the power that's in that reserve? Well, that's going to vary, again, based on the manufacturer's design. Our PoE amplifiers will not shut down or stop passing any audio. So that's important to, important to know when looking at these. We're also not going to exceed the power that's available from the switch. If you try to pull more power from the switch than you have negotiated and requested for, which in our case is going to be the max of the 30 watts, if you try to pull more than that, the switch is going to go in to protect itself and it's going to shut that port down and you're going to lose audio. And losing audio in the middle of, of a meeting or a presentation of some sort is a very bad thing. So we're not going to shut down, we're not going to stop passing audio, we're not going to cause the switch to shut down if you drive our amplifier so hard that you're pulling all of that power out of that reserve. We're just going to turn it down. We're basically just going to turn it down so your peaks are actually hitting the maximum continuous power that's available until we can recharge that reserve. And then we'll give you a little bit more level. And if you, if you found yourself in a situation where you're doing that all the time, and you're constantly running that out and pulling, depleting that reserve, then you really need to go back and I think you've really got a design problem and things are not really matched up correctly. 
So what exactly is this burst power? So burst power isn't something new. Biamp did not invent this burst power idea. There's actually a standard around this. So, uh, a lot of the car audio manufacturers really lobbied hard for these standards. That CTA 2006, there's a B, I think there's an A version as well. But you know, car audio, uh, DC voltage, 12 volts. You're powering your amplifiers off of 12 volts and and they want everybody to be able to measure to the same standard. So you're really comparing apples to apples when you're looking at power amplifier specifications. So this standard defines various details like how how fast you recover, how, how long the bursts are, uh, what those levels are. And we've actually found that we, we we actually made changes when we originally designed this. We went back before we released it and made changes to actually exceed that standard. So we're actually exceeding that standard when it comes to the burst power. And you can see it in some other amplifiers over the years, uh, peak power or peak reserves, things like that, that, that exist. Um, but what are we doing? What What is BiAMP doing that makes this unique, that we're utilizing this burst power? Well, we're using it as, as PoE, and we've got a patented power supply, and our goal here is to make this as efficient and cost-effective as possible. So we want to deliver as much power as we possibly can from that, using that power reserve. We want to maximize on that while providing a solution that is, is cost-effective. Also, our PoE amplifiers integrate seamlessly as part of an overall Tessera system. So you create one file, multiple devices. You just drop an amplifier block in there. Compile it, send it, and the compiler will take care of the rest for you. So it's part of that entire Tessera ecosystem. And we also want systems that are easy to install and make the most efficient use of available resources. With our microphones now, we have a microphone, the pendant microphone, and now the newer little TCMX puck mount microphone that mount either as hanging or up flush against the ceiling. You can you can buy that with an amplifier included, and you can get two microphones and up to four loudspeakers connected over one Cat5 cable run up the wall and one PoE Plus port on your switch. So switch ports may be a cost issue. Um, you don't want to run a bunch of cabling, so we can just do this quite simply. You can run a small room from your DSP to a switch port that has PoE Plus, maybe that's a mid-span, shoot one Cat5 cable up the wall across the ceiling, and you can have two microphones and four speakers off of that one run. So the goal here is to make it efficient and easy to install. So we'll run through our PoE Plus amplifier portfolio. The first one we came out with was our AMP450P, and that's the one you see here on the top. Oops. And then we have the AMP450BP, which is, is newer. Now the difference between these devices are primarily around the connectors. They deliver the exact same power. Both give you that 50 watts burst power on a four ohm load, 30 watts on an eight ohm load, with the option of picking whether you want a single, dual, or four channel, and then they deliver 15, seven, and three watts per channel on that. Both AVB powered class D amplifiers. And, um, the biggest difference on these are the connectors and the form factor for mounting. The 450P has the yellow Phoenix connectors with traditional, you know, screw the speaker wires into it, plug them in. The 450BP is our backpack amplifier, and this is designed with RJ45 connectors for Cat5 cabling to go to your speakers. And this matches up with our new loudspeaker line. Our DeSona loudspeaker line has RJ45 inputs. And again, the goal here is to make it as easy as possible to install. And that's why we have these connectors. And these will also screw to the back of a CIC6. So you can mount this amplifier to the back, hence the term backpack, of one of our ceiling speakers, and then use a small Cat5 jumper to the first speaker, and then pre-made Cat5 cables. You know, just throw them across in your drop ceiling, plenum rated, of course, uh, to get to all of your speakers. Now, some people may balk a little bit at, well, you can't use Cat5 cables for for speakers, and if you go to Cornerstone again and do a search for our DeSono speakers or the 450 BP, we have some information on here. We we did research. There's an equivalent gauge. 
if you use Cat5 cable, there is an equivalent gauge if you, you know, go more than just two of those together. So what we're doing with these Cat5 connections is we have eight conductors in a Cat5 or Cat6 cable, and we're taking four of them, putting them together for the plus, four of them for the minus. And if you do that, your equivalent wire gauge of 26 gauge Cat5 is equivalent to a 20 gauge speaker cable. So with that, you can get a maximum distance of up to 46 feet, you know, if you're just almost a 50 feet with only one dB of loss in that cable to an 8 ohm speaker. If you have higher gauge uh, cat, cat cable, then you can go longer distances. But please think back to the use case on this. If you've got a 120 foot run um, of cat five for this, you're not getting the power at the speaker. And the whole goal behind this product line is you want to get the power amplifier as close to the speaker as possible. So using the Cat5, Cat6 cable for this turns out to be a very viable solution, especially when you're mounting the box in the ceiling, and then you've got your ceiling speakers, which are pretty close, fanning out from that box. So the other option we have is the TCM1A and TCM-XA. The TCM1 is our little pendant mount beam tracking microphone, which hangs from the ceiling. It has a plenum box that mounts up in the ceiling. And that plenum box has a two-channel amplifier. And our new model, which is a TCM-XA, also has a plenum box. It doesn't hang down from the ceiling. It mounts flush up against the ceiling. But it also has that same amplifier built in it. So with this model, we have a two-channel amplifier. Same technology on the inside, but we need more power to drive those microphone arrays. So we can only do two channels on that. So we're getting 40 watts uh, to 4 ohms, 30 watt burst into 8 ohms. And if we're using a dual channel amplifier, we've got 4 watts continuous or 8 watts if we're using a single channel amplifier. So again, back to that calculator, 4 watts of continuous power into a speaker with you know 90 dB sensitivity is going to get pretty loud in that room. The difference uh, between the plenum boxes and the A and the XA, or the TCM1A and the TCM-XA, really are also the connectors. The TCM1A was out first, and it it has the uh, RJ4, sorry, the uh, Phoenix connectors on it, the screw uh, compression terminals, and then the TCM-XA has the RJ45 connections. Sorry, bear with me just one second here. So we get asked sometimes, why are we not doing 70 or 100 volt uh, speakers on these amplifiers? Well, as you know, 70 or 100 volt uh, systems do have some advantages. Biggest advantage, you've got one cable pull and you can attach a bunch of speakers to it. One of the biggest disadvantage, or the biggest disadvantages, sorry, uh, adding transformers. You have to have transformers on every single speaker, and that adds cost. Um, transformers also impact the audio quality. There's some insertion loss when you have a transformer on that speaker, so it's going to degrade that audio quality. So when we're talking about small speakers, small numbers of speakers, and short speaker runs, it really didn't make sense to 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 do that because we're really getting that single cable solution with the PoE Plus, and we don't have the disadvantages of adding transformers. If you, if you want to get away from the quality impacts of the transformers, then you have to buy more expensive transformers, which drives your cost up as well. So trying to make this uh, cost effective and easy to install, which gets back to the primary benefits of why we want to do this. You no longer have to worry about long, loud speaker cable runs. You don't have to pull you know, two different uh, whatever, 16, 18 gauge pair of speaker cables throughout your ceiling. You don't have to worry about the transformers and taps. Uh, you, you just get, get your Cat5 cable up there, get power to the amplifier unit, and then do short runs out to your speakers. Now we're talking about a very low number of speakers per amplifier channel count, which that makes it easy to use this technology for a mix minus system. A mix minus system, you're going to want to have you know, just maybe one, maybe just a very small number of speakers on one amplifier channel. So you don't want to spend a bunch of money on a large, you know, maybe a hundred watt per channel, four channel amplifier to do a mix minus system where you could buy, you know, when you're only going to have one or two speakers on a channel, you could use a 450p and have four channels 
and not have that excess power. And you can easily implement a mix minus system with that. We're minimizing the longer cable runs for to, to get to out, out to our speakers. And a big thing is to make it easy to install. You can send an install tech out to, to a conference room, you know, your typical room in an office building, maybe it's got a drop ceiling and drywall. You can poke some pre-made Cat5 cables up there, get to the unit, put the unit in, drill some holes in the ceiling, connect everything and be up and running pretty quickly with this. And we also want to minimize the switch ports. So we're, we're allowing multiple devices like our, our, the amplifier gives you four channels on one, one port. The microphone gives you two amp channels. And in the case of the TCM1A, you can get three microphones off of one network run. And the TCM-XA allows you to have two. So that is pretty much it. That's what I had for our presentation. If you feel free to email me. You can also email us to, uh, if you have any technical questions, please email support at biamp.com. Check out our website, biamp.com. We have some technical resources there, as well as uh, support.biamp.com is our cornerstone site. And we have quite a bit of information available there as well. Thank you very much all for your time. And uh, please let us know if you have any questions. Thanks.